chapter three. Optimization over one way, invite over inflict. In this chapter, we look at a couple of anti-patterns and patterns. The first one is one size fits all, the first anti-pattern. And this is where organizations take one, for example, scaling framework with or one set of prescriptive practices and inflict that across an entire organization. Now an organization, every organization is, is unique. Every organization also is, contains a whole bunch of unique context within it. So applying one set of prescriptive practices is not going to optimize for outcomes. It cannot optimize for outcomes. There was one organization I worked with where there was a top-down mandate to um, for everybody to adopt mandatory two-week iterations. So of course, with a lack of psychological safety and a command and control culture, everybody adopted mandatory two-week iterations. When I did a floor walk and I went around and I spoke to the teams, I was getting questions such as, um, so when we've done our three two-week iterations of analysis and then our three two-week iterations of development and then our three two-week iterations of testing, what happens when we get a bug from our from testing and we're already on to our next set of three two-week iterations of development? People are obviously with a charitable intent doing the best within their level of unlearning and relearning and support. However, clearly that is not going to optimize for outcomes. Um, there is a natural pace of, of unlearning and relearning, a natural pace of change, um, and inflicting one size fits all across many unique contexts, again, cannot possibly optimize for outcomes. So instead, it's not a case of one size fits all. Instead, um, focus on the outcomes, be very clear what the outcome is, and then allow teams to use their own brains with coaching and support, as much coaching and support as the teams would like, ideally on a pull, you know, actually on a pull basis, pull basis rather than a push basis. Um, allow teams to um, use their own brains and build a muscle memory for continuous improvement aligned to the outcomes. And then the team might experiment with a two-week iteration or a three-week iteration or single-piece flow and limited work in progress with smaller waterfalls, whatever whatever that team decides, again, with some expert advice and coaching and training and support and learning through doing works for them in their unique context. Um, so the second part here is to, the second anti-pattern is to inflict over invite. And this is a top-down infliction, um, generally comes with a lack of psychological safety uh, in a command and control behavioral norm where, again, teams have no choice. They're told, this is how you're going to work and this is what you have to do. Again, there is a gentic state. There is, uh, motivation is not internal, motivation is external. And actually people, people's vested interest is um, not necessarily in line with achieving better outcomes. People's vested interest is to do the minimum they have to do to achieve this command that's coming down um, with, with a lack of feeling of empowerment. So in itself, it's not an agile mindset. It's not espousing the cultural values that we expect with agile and lean around empowered teams who are uh, free to experiment and learn for themselves as to how to improve their ways of working. So um, instead, obviously, invite over inflict, um, invite participation, diffusion of innovation curve, Everett Rogers, 1962, normal distribution on the left of the innovators. So a key here is to start with the innovators, start with the natural champions when you're inviting participation. Start with the natural champions. There are a number of ways to do this. Very simply, ask for volunteers. Um, say this is this is the, the journey that we're on, this is the path that we're on, these are the outcomes that we want. Who would like to go first? Who would like to come and experiment? Uh, I've also found running a community of practice, a voluntary law of two feet, 
community of practice um, is another good way to identify the natural innovators because they're the ones who turn up regularly every single time. You have a community of practice meeting. Um, you see the people who are genuinely passionate. Um, so start with your innovators, invite participation, um, and then generate social proof. So as you generate social proof, that is then encouraging for the early adopters and the early majority to then put a toe in the water. Um, clearly it's safe to go in the water, it's safe to get involved, um, and there should be recognition and reward of the desired behaviours. So then you end up with a sustainable, um, sustainable increase in invitation um, and around ways of working. It's also within risk appetite as well. Um, because it's not trying to do not trying to do too much too soon. Um, you're going at the pace of the change working, being being uh, the, the word safer and better value sooner, safer, happier. It's within risk appetite, it's safe. If any point things are not working, you pause, you, you resolve the impediment, and then you carry on again. Um, so that's a, another important pattern in chapter three.